Hello everyone, my name is Andre and in this video we're going to be talking about the real web developer roadmap. Now there's a ton of videos out there about how to become a web developer, what should you learn, here are all the skills that you need to learn. Now how is this any different? Well, I'm going to be doing the same thing, but along the way, I actually want to teach you some principles as well as really show the entire landscape. And in order for me to do that, I created, well, Jean-Claude the Octopus. And you're thinking to yourself, um, Andre, octopuses have eight legs. Well, let's not get into the details here. The web development landscape is pretty big, so had to make more than eight legs. And this is Jean-Claude's friend, little Timmy. Now, this landscape and this web development path has a lot of information. We are going to talk about React. We're going to talk about all the front end. We're going to talk about hosting, cloud, testing, CICD, even WebAssembly. We're going to talk about backend and databases. And looking at this, I know you're thinking, wow, that's really overwhelming. Do I really need to learn all this stuff? And the truth of the matter is, no, not really. Now, what I'm going to show you in this roadmap is to cover the current landscape so that you know what's out there, you know how things are connected, so that you know how each of them relate to one another, but also hoping that you will actually learn something instead of just overwhelm you with all the choices. And for that, I've actually created little rockets for you. So as I talk about the landscape, you'll see that some items are gonna have rockets, which signify that you should probably learn them because they're super important. Other things don't have rockets and are more for you to understand that they exist so that one day when you need them, you can go read up and learn about it on your own. Now, the goal of this roadmap is to actually get you to a point where you can get a job as a web developer. Because at the end of the day, all the YouTube videos, all the tutorials, all the coding boot camps that you do don't really teach you as much as real life experience. The best way to learn is to actually work in teams for a company day to day on the job and getting paid doing that doesn't sound bad either. So I'm going to be focusing on what is going to get you a job in this current year. Now, the next question you might have is, who are you? Why should I even listen to you? Well, this is uh, my face right here. I'm Andre and I've worked as a software engineer for numerous years. I've worked in Toronto and Silicon Valley, but I've also spent the last two years teaching over 200,000 students how to code. Some of them are graduates of computer science degrees. Some of them are completely self-taught programmers, but all of them wanna to learn to code, to become great web developers. And some of them even work at some pretty nice companies. But I also write a monthly newsletter, a web developer monthly newsletter, where every month I recap exactly what happens in our industry, any news, any resources, any changes. So I have to stay up to date with the industry. So this is my job. My job is to stay current with the web development trends. So that's why I think I'm qualified to talk about this subject. With that said, I want to warn you. And this is something that is just general advice. What I'm going to talk about in this web developer roadmap are just my opinions. And I will simplify some things. I will make recommendations based on my experience and my opinion. That doesn't mean that you should follow it 100%. If anybody tells you their way is the only way, they're probably lying to you. So use this video as a reference as if I'm your friend and I'm just giving you my advice on what you should learn. From there, do your own research and figure out the path that best suits you. For example, when we talk about the front end, well, maybe you'll decide that you wanna become a front end developer. Or maybe you think, mm, I don't think I like that, but what interests me is to be a back end developer or work with databases or even work with mobile. The choice is up to you, so once again, decide for yourself what you want to take away from this video. 
Now, the reason I created this diagram is that I was a self-taught programmer as well. And I remember when I got started, it was really overwhelming. It seemed like you have to learn so many things. And I mean, looking at this diagram, well, it's a lot of things. But I never knew how things are connected. How is one related to another? What does Node do? What does PHP do? What does Python do? How does it fit into this whole landscape? So being a self-taught programmer, I always found it useful to connect the dots, to make sure I understood how each one is related to the other. But enough talk. I think you're getting excited. So let's start diving into what the web development landscape looks like in the current year. So the very first thing you want to do if you want to become a web developer is to start with the basic fundamentals. Now, at the end of the day, web pages are just data that we try and show to a user. And that user can interact with it, usually submitting forms like sending a tweet or posting an Instagram picture. Well, when it comes to the basic fundamentals, there's a few things that we want to learn. But the biggest thing is to understand that the internet at the end of the day is all just a bunch of wires. And these are real wires that are connecting everyone around the world with internet. And the way we view web pages, well, we have a browser and this browser sends a request to a computer somewhere in the world called a server and says, hey, uh, can you give me some data, some information? Maybe you want to Google how to make delicious chicken soup. And the server says, yep, no problem. Here, you can have this data. And the way it sends this data, it's through a protocol called HTTP or HTTPS. And it usually sends these three files. That's right. They're just files, CSS, HTML, and JavaScript. But we'll get to that in a bit. The job of a web developer is to write these files, these HTML, CSS, and JavaScript files so that we can display information to the user. So the first step is to learn about editors and IDEs. These are text editors and developer environments that allow us to write what we call code. For example, the most popular one is Visual Studio Code. I personally like Sublime Text, but there's many, many choices. And as you can see, all they do, they let you write code. But at the end of the day, there's just text that you're writing on a file, except that they give you these nice color syntax and give you hints so that you can write code better. So once you learn about IDEs, editors, it doesn't really matter what you pick. Just pick probably Visual Studio Code because it's the most popular. And from there, you can start writing your HTML, CSS, and JavaScript files. You want to learn about Git and GitHub. Nothing too crazy here. You may have heard of it, but it's a way for programmers to save code online and essentially have a social profile of all the code that they've written. Next, you also want to learn about terminal PowerShell command prompt. For example, I have my terminal right here. A terminal or what we call a command line is simply a way for you to communicate with your computer without using a mouse like this. It's a text-based way to work with your computer. Now, why does a web developer need to know that? Well, beyond looking cool like you know what you're doing, it also allows you to do a lot of important things as a programmer. For example, Git and GitHub, well, the way you use Git is through something like a terminal. Now, if you're a Windows user, you use something like PowerShell or Command Prompt, but Windows also now has a terminal that you can use, which looks kind of like this, or you can even do something like WSL2, which is Windows subsystem for Linux to run Linux-like commands. But we're getting ahead of ourselves. Let's not worry too much about that. So now that you have your IDE set up, your GitHub profile set up, you have your terminal set up, you then want to learn about what are these domain name servers. Domain name servers are, well, you may have heard of them. Something like GoDaddy or Namecheap allow you to buy a domain name. For example, I bought 0 and I bought it on Namecheap. 
domain name servers are ways for us to say, hey, zero to mastery.io, where is that computer? Remember this diagram? With a DNS server, we wanna say, where is this computer in the world so that I can get these files to the browser? For example, I can run a command on my terminal called ping google.com. And here, look, I get a little number over here. So if I copy this number, which is called an IP address, and I paste it in, look at that. It takes me to google.com. A DNS server essentially says, hey, this number points to a computer somewhere in the world and figure out what name is associated with this number, this address. And well, this one happens to be google.com. So zero to mastery.io is also going to have an address. So once we learn about that, then you should learn a little bit about something called FTP and SFTP or file transfer protocol. And back in the day, if let's say you wanted to become a WordPress developer, well, WordPress, which is a very popular tool for creating blogs, you usually, what you would do is you'd buy a domain name, sign up for WordPress, and then you use something like HostGator to host your files. So remember our diagram. HostGator was something where they provided the computer for you and you just give it the files that you want this computer to serve to the user. Now, WordPress went even further and took care of this whole JavaScript, HTML, and CSS. So even if you don't know how to program, well, they'll just help you as long as you write a bunch of blog posts, they'll help you display and send that information to the user. But if you wanted to get a lot more fancy and you wanted to write your own HTML, CSS, and JavaScript files, like we have on this website, well, then you can use something like FTP, SFTP to transfer your files of HTML, CSS, and JavaScript to that server somewhere in the world. Well, you can use a tool like Cyberdoc if you're on a Mac, which looks like this. I just drag and drop some files and it puts those files on a server for me or something like FileZilla if you're on Windows. Next, you wanna learn a little bit about HTTP, HTTPS. This is essentially the way that browsers communicate with servers. If I click over here, you see that I'm using HTTPS. S stands for secure, which means that, see that little lock? It means that this communication with the server is secure. So maybe I can even submit passwords or my user information over our internet cables and it'll be secure, technically. Then you wanna learn about JSON, XML, and gRPC. Now, gRPC is something new. Maybe you don't need to know about it, but it's good to understand what it does. This JSON XML gRPC, if we take a look, kind of looks like this. It's the way that we transfer data from servers to clients. For example, JSON, if I wanted to send IDEA 42, well, this is what it'll look like. XML looks like this. And gRPC, which technically uses protobufs, sends data like this, this different way to send data across the web. And then finally, you might wanna learn about SSH. SSH is really, really important for you as a web developer, mainly for working with GitHub. For example, if you go to GitHub, to one of your repositories, you can usually clone the code using SSH or HTTPS but you can also use SSH to actually log in to a server somewhere or a computer somewhere. For example, I can use the command SSH in my terminal to say some user at this IP address, go and log in there. And it'll probably ask me for a password. So SSH is really, really important. But at the end of the day, when we talk about basic fundamentals, that's what we're doing, right? We are just learning how the internet works, how servers, send files to browsers? How does Google send their JavaScript, HTML, and CSS files to Google Chrome or Firefox or Safari so that myself as a user can see what is happening? Now, don't spend too much time on these things. These are just fundamentals for you to understand how things work instead of going and writing HTML, CSS, and JavaScript code without really understanding what you're doing or what all this magic is, 
These fundamentals are going to help you understand how things work. Why do we have things like Git and GitHub? But you also work with all of these throughout your web development career, so you don't need to understand them perfectly. One final thing. The next thing that you want to focus on or understand are something called web APIs. You see, web APIs are essentially tools that browsers give us. For example, we have Google Chrome. And Google Chrome has little things that we can use so that we can make websites. For example, the DOM or the document object model allows us to use JavaScript to modify different things around the page. Things like Fetch and XHR. By the way, Fetch is a more modern, newer version of XHR allows us to fetch or retrieve data from other websites. We have things like local storage to save user information. For example, let's say you log into a website and then you come back to it and you're still logged in. It might use something like local storage or something like service workers, where it allows you to do some interesting thing called caching and also allows us to do something called progressive web apps, which we're going to talk about later. And then we have things like internationalization so that websites can display different languages. These web APIs are provided by the browser. And using JavaScript, you can usually use these tools and use JavaScript to say, hey, fetch me some data. Hey, modify this DOM so that the web page looks different. And oh boy, I've been talking a lot and it already seems overwhelming. And I got some bad news for you. All this stuff that I just talked about isn't going to get you a job. I know, I know. I'm not trying to waste your time, but you have to understand that to really know what's going on, you want to focus on these fundamentals and build that foundation. But once you just on the surface understand what these basic things do, and like I said, you don't need to dive deep into it, you can then go on to the fun part. And that is the front end right here. Now, don't worry, we'll go back to advanced fundamentals later on. But I recommend instead of going into advanced, which won't mean much if you don't have a bit of experience, we're going to dive into the front end. And this is the path that I recommend. If you want to become a web developer, whether you are not interested in front end or not, it's good to understand the landscape because the front end landscape, well, it's a big one. I promise you, I won't talk too long. We'll fly through this one, but it's a pretty big step. So let's take a look at front end. That's what you might call a front end developer. And the front end developer, well, they work with this side of the stack. They're the ones that say, hey, what should I display on the website? Let's go have a look. All right, let's talk about front end. We talked about the fundamentals, but you shouldn't really spend too much time on the fundamentals because like I said, it doesn't help you get a job. Just understand them at the basic level, what they mean, but then move on to the front end. And this is where things get interesting. If you want the fastest way to get a job, I recommend starting with the front end. Now the front end is what the user sees. Your web app, your web page, is worked on by front-end developers. Sometimes they're called JavaScript developers. Sometimes they're called React, Angular, Vue developers. We're going to get into that. But it's a long road ahead. So let's talk about what you should learn to be a modern front-end developer. Now, I'm going to keep saying this over and over, but don't get overwhelmed. When you see all these topics and you think to yourself, there's no way I'm going to get there. The road ahead is just so long, there's no way that I'm qualified or able to ever become a web developer. Remember, the harder a skill is, the more valuable a skill is, the less people that are willing to take that path. So use this to your advantage. The fact that there is so much to learn allows you to have a chance to get a valuable skill, to do something that people pay a lot of money for. So with that said, I've tried to make this section easy for you to follow so that if you want, you can just focus on the little rockets over here. And those are the big topics that you really want to focus on. And the smaller stuff, you don't necessarily have to worry too much about because remember, the goal is to get a job so that you can get experience as soon as possible. All right, let's get started. 
First, you want to learn about HTML, specifically HTML5, which is the latest specification. Remember, it's a file that displays text. HTML is simply, hey, what text should I display on this web page or a web app? And that's it. It was the initial way that the web started. The web started with just HTML files that allowed universities to communicate and share text with each other. And there are a lot of things you can do with HTML before introducing JavaScript. For example, you can do forms and submitting forms like usernames and passwords. And at the end of the day, most websites that we use are just forms, right? On Facebook, we submit a form to post something on our newsfeed. On Instagram, we post a picture, we submit a form. On Twitter, we tweet something by submitting a form. Now, when it comes to HTML, it's all just these tags that we can use to describe what our web page should display. Now, there's a ton of them, but you don't need to really memorize all of them. You just need to remember the important ones. And then you wanna dive into topics like semantic HTML. That literally means how can you describe your HTML file the best? For example, you can use something like article to say, hey, this section has an article. Hey, this section has address. This is the footer of the website. Semantic simply means describe to the best of your ability using the tags or the HTML element tags, what your website displays. You also want to dabble a little bit in SEO, that is search engine optimization. Essentially, HTML tags and the text that are within them allow places like Google to rank your websites and say, oh, this website is about chicken soup. So I'm going to rank it in my databases so that when a user searches for chicken soup, your website's going to show up. And HTML has a big impact on SEO. Again, something on the surface that you need to know, but you don't really need to dive that deeply. You wanna learn about accessibility. That is, how can we make web pages and web apps accessible to everybody? Not everybody maybe can view websites and they need a visual aid or they need a screen reader to understand what a website does. It's very important for us to consider everybody when building web apps and web pages. And then obviously forms. There's a lot you can do when it comes to HTML and forms before we even introduce JavaScript, but HTML forms is a really important part of the web. Now, keep in mind that when it comes to HTML, it's really easy to start going one by one and learning every single element, which is a complete waste of time. Just focus on the important ones that you see a lot of, like div. But then you have things like tables in HTML that honestly, barely anybody ever uses anymore. Next, we want to dive into CSS or CSS3, which is the latest specification. Now, CSS is what style does your web app or web page should have? Does it have pretty colors? Does it look yellow, green? All the nice looking websites use CSS to make them look nice. Now, when it comes to CSS, the important things to keep in mind, especially for modern websites, are these four things. You can do animations with CSS now, so you wanna look at CSS animations. You can do something called CSS variables now, which is a fairly new feature. And CSS variables allow us to do something cool like black or dark and white theme on websites just using variables. You wanna learn about the difference between rem, em, and pixels. And this allows you to define the size of an element on a page. For example, we wanna start using rem, which is relative size, so that our websites become more responsive and mobile friendly than if we just use pixels. So it's recommended to start using rem for let's say your font sizes. And then you wanna learn about media queries. Media queries are the things that allow our websites to be displayed on different screens. Everybody checks out a website on their computer, their phone, all these different screen sizes and modern web apps need to be responsive. For example, if I change the size of this, this should be responsive, right? Media queries allow us to do this. Now, there's a ton of CSS 
features that you can learn. And again, just like HTML, you don't wanna to spend too much time learning every single one, reading it one by one. CSS is one of those things that you just search and understand and read up on as the need arises. A lot of the times you can go to your favorite website and just simply open up the developer console, inspect it, and see what kind of CSS that your favorite element uses. Now, the one thing that is important with CSS and probably the hardest part to get, especially when you're starting out, is something called CSS layout. And CSS layout is all about where should we position elements or components on our website. Now, luckily for us, the modern CSS has two really good tools that we didn't used to have before. That is Flexbox and CSS Grid. And using these two, you can pretty much do any sort of layout that you want. And as a matter of fact, if you use Flexbox and CSS Grid properly, you actually might not even need media queries or a lot less media queries than we were used to. And if you wanna learn Flexbox or CSX Grid, I actually have a resources page on my website where you can play fun games like Flexbox Defense, Flexbox Froggy, or Grid Garden to learn how to do layout with CSS. Now, the other parts of CSS that you might wanna focus on is something like the box model how margins and padding work to make those minor adjustments. You wanna learn about positioning, display, and floats. These three things are ways to display and position elements, but a lot of them, like floats, are now outdated and using Flexbox and CSS Grid is preferred, which is why these two have rockets. You should definitely learn these. You also have options like Bootstrap. You see, Bootstrap was really popular back in the day because of the grid system it had. It allowed us to do layouts really, really easy before we had things like Flexbox and CSS Grid. Bootstrap now is still popular, but less so because we have these two things. So yeah, just focus on these two for layout. Now, the next thing is preprocessors. And preprocessors are essentially ways for us to write a souped up or a superset of CSS that allows us to have extra features and then they get pre-processed into regular CSS. And the most popular one and the one that you probably should stick with is SAS. There's obviously post CSS and less as well, but SAS is the most popular right now. And SAS pretty much looks like this. You can see over here that instead of the regular CSS, you can have some extra features that you're, you don't have. And then before you publish your website, you can just convert it or pre-process it into CSS. So this turns into this. Now, don't worry too much about SAS. I've actually never fully studied SAS. Whenever it comes up, it's similar enough to CSS that you can learn it on the spot. You can probably spend a day and just learn the different features between SAS and CSS but think of it as a way for you to have superpowers with CSS. Once you're done with that, then you wanna think about organizing your CSS. One problem that we'll constantly see throughout this web developer roadmap is that as projects get bigger and bigger, it becomes harder and harder to manage. And a lot of these tools help us not to build really small, tiny one-page websites. They help us build really big web apps like Facebook that have so many features. And Organizing CSS is one of those things. When your CSS file becomes not just one file, but hundreds and thousands of files, how do you manage it? Now, these sort of problems seem kind of hard unless you actually experience them. In your head, why not just put all your CSS into one file? It keeps things simple. But it's hard to really understand the problem until you encounter it. But trust me on this, as things get bigger and bigger, you need tools to manage them. And some of the tools to manage or organize your CSS is something like Smacks, or I think it is Scalable Modular Architecture CSS, OOCS, which is Object-Oriented CSS, BEM, which is, I actually have it here because I forgot what it was, what was it? It's the Block Element Modifier. All these difficult names that essentially just are ways for you to organize CSS. To be honest, they are a little bit outdated, I'm personally a big fan of something like Atomic CSS, which is a lot more scalable, a lot easier to understand, and tools like 
Tailwind CSS, which we'll talk about later, uh, use. There's also a special CSS and JS way of organizing styles. And this is a more modern way that was introduced with something we'll talk about later, which is React. This is the idea that, hey, instead of writing CSS the regular way, let's just write it inside of JavaScript and then whatever tool or library we'll use will just apply those styles automatically. So Facebook that pioneered the CSS and JS mentality has its own implementation. There's CSS modules. There's something called styled components that's really popular with React projects and also emotions as well. Now, you don't need to worry too much about this unless you really want to dive into being something like a React developer, which we'll get into. For now, just focus on atomic CSS. And that is just using really neat libraries like Tailwind CSS. And you can see here, you just add CSS like this. Or my favorite is tachyons. Whew, that's a lot. And the last part of CSS is the frameworks and libraries that come with it. Now, frameworks and libraries are infinite. There's so many. You can create a library. You can create a framework. Essentially, they're helpers. Instead of all of us, all developers, all designers writing CSS from scratch, maybe we can share some of the nice things. For example, I might really like this button. It would be nice if Dan over here shared this with me so I can use it on my website. Well, in a sense, frameworks and libraries are that a way for us to use tools that are already pre-built for us. And when it comes to CSS, we have things like Foundation, like Bootstrap, like Bulma, like Materialize CSS, like Tailwind CSS that give us pre-built styles. So for example, one of the popular tools is Tailwind CSS that's becoming really popular these days, it allows us to have all this styling just by writing a few lines that would have required a lot more lines in the past. And one of the things that they have is they have the new Tailwind UI. So you can actually use UI components, that is user interface components, and just put them on your website. Remember how I wanted this button on my website? Well, these libraries and frameworks allow us to just plug and play and add these nice styles and components to our website. But for now, you don't really need to specialize in them. Just understand that they exist. And if you ever want to build your own project, I recommend maybe using Tailwind or even going with something like Bulma and Bootstrap. Now, I'm going to disappoint you once again because we talked about the fundamentals. We talked about HTML and CSS. And let's say you mastered all these three things. Well, you probably still won't get a job as a web developer. As a matter of fact, you won't really encounter these topics in your interview most of the time. Because now we're getting to the exciting part. When it comes to front end, the principal skill, the main skill that you really need to know is JavaScript. That's why front end developers are usually called JavaScript developers or React developers or Angular developers. Because HTML and CSS, although not easy, are things that you can usually pick up fairly quick. The key for you is not to spend too much time on HTML and CSS, and instead dive into the JavaScript world. Because as you build websites, as you build web apps, you're going to keep learning about HTML and CSS. But the thing that's really hard, the thing that makes you valuable is your JavaScript knowledge. So let's get started with that. Now, JavaScript allows interactivity in our websites. Back in the day, web pages were just that, just pages with text. Then we had CSS so we can add some styling. But then JavaScript came along and said, hey, let's play games on the web. Let's have drop down menus. Let's have interactivity. And JavaScript controls the behavior or what the web page does beyond just displaying information. Now, to get started with JavaScript, you definitely need to understand the fundamentals. Things like ECMAScript, which is the specification of JavaScript. That is, there's a governing body that says, hey, this is what JavaScript should look like. This is what JavaScript code is. You want to learn about asynchronous JavaScript. There's this thing called synchronous and asynchronous. And the idea of asynchronous allows us to do some really interesting things when it comes to performance, especially when it comes to the web. 
you obviously need to know the basics. And the basics are things that all programming languages usually have, whether it's Python, PHP, Ruby, Java. All these languages usually have some ideas of loops, conditionals, functions, maybe classes. These are the basic things, the building blocks of a programming language that allow us to tell a computer what to do. You then wanna learn a little bit about OOP versus FP. What is that? Well, it's object-oriented programming versus functional programming. Now, this is more of a design idea. As programs get more and more complicated, we need to organize our code. We need to make our code cleaner or easier to understand because most of the time, we're not the only ones working on a project. We are working with tens, hundreds, sometimes thousands of other programmers and sharing hundreds, thousands of files. And object-oriented programming and functional programming allow us to create clean, maintainable code, hypothetically. These are more high-level ideas, but it's really important to understand what the differences are. This is a bit of an advanced topic that will take some time getting used to, but it's good to know that they exist. Then you want to learn about DOM manipulation and web APIs. Now, remember in the fundamentals, where is it? Hold on, let's zoom out here. There it is. Remember in the fundamentals how I said we have these things called web APIs, and one of them is the DOM. Well, browsers like Chrome, Safari, and Firefox allow us to manipulate the DOM or the way our page looks using JavaScript. So using these web APIs, which are essentially tools that browsers give us, we can use JavaScript to manipulate and change these things. For example, you want to do a drop-down menu? Well, JavaScript can do that. Well, you want to have sparkles and glitter every time you scroll through your website? Well, JavaScript can do that too. And this is probably the biggest thing when it comes to the web. JavaScript essentially allows us to change things on the page. And a lot of the libraries and frameworks we talk about are doing exactly this. Then we want to learn about modules and especially the ES6 modules. And this is an ECMAScript specification that, well, we're now way into ES, what, 11, ES12? Because every year the language evolves and adapts. So JavaScript is constantly evolving. New features are being added. And one of the most important ones is this idea of modules. Modules in programming is all about what happens when we have more than one file. JavaScript was initially a toy language, a language that we could just have one single file of and do funny things or simple things on a website. But as JavaScript got bigger and bigger, as we got bigger and bigger websites like Google Maps, like Facebook, we couldn't just keep all JavaScript into one page. And this idea of modules was introduced natively to JavaScript with the ES6 modules. This allows us to have hundreds of JavaScript files and all of them we can use on a single web app. So definitely learn about this and the history of modules when it comes to JavaScript because it's an interesting one. All right, and before we get into everybody's favorite topic, frameworks libraries. Let's talk about these ones. You see, I've added them here because these are all compilers. What does that mean? Well, a compiler is simply taking one language, like let's say TypeScript, compiles it and spits out another language, in this case, JavaScript. And all of these, TypeScript, Svelte, Elm, ReasonML, Babel, are ways to write a specific program using something similar to JavaScript, but not really, but then spit out JavaScript. It's similar to what we saw in the CSS, the preprocessors, right, with SAS. What they do is essentially let you write a superset, like TypeScript, of JavaScript that gives JavaScript extra feature, and in this case, static typing. We have things like Svelte, you write in a custom Svelte way and it spits out raw JavaScript. And then functional languages like Elm and ReasonML that again spit out JavaScript. Or things like Babel that allow us to write modern JavaScript with some new features and spit out JavaScript. All of these are compilers, sometimes called transpilers, that give JavaScript superpowers for those people that want it, but still at the end of the day spit out JavaScript because on the web, you can only use JavaScript. Well, kind of, we'll get to that later in the video. All right, 
So we have that. We have the fundamentals. Next, we want to go into frameworks and libraries. And this is a big one. It's everyone's favorite topic. Everywhere you go on the web, you'll see articles like this. And yes, I did it too. React versus Angular versus Vue. What's your favorite? What's the best one? Now, this is such a big field that one of the hottest jobs for the past couple of years has been a React developer. That's right. Just being a professional developer means learning this one library or one framework. You'll see jobs like React developer, Angular developer, Vue JS developer. All of these are ways for us to write JavaScript, but in a more clean way, just like we saw with CSS. As projects get bigger and bigger, it's nice to have some sort of a kitchen that we can work in that already have pre-built tools, just like we did with CSS. Now, all of these, at the end of the day, do what JavaScript does, which is to DOM manipulation and work with APIs. Now, this current year, React is still dominant. It's the number one. If you really want to get into it, I show you here exactly what the numbers are. React is pretty dominant still. There's two Angulars here because oh, there was originally Angular JS, and then they did a big rewrite, and now there's the Angular, which is the more modern one that is starting to die down a bit. There's still a lot of enterprise applications that run Ang Angular, but not too many new applications or not too many people excited about Angular. Sorry if I offended you, just my personal opinion. And then we have things like Vue.js, which are newer and a lot simpler to learn than something like Angular and React, but very, very popular still. And then things like jQuery. jQuery was there before all these libraries existed and they essentially allowed really simple DOM manipulation and was one of the most popular libraries that's now starting to die down a bit just because all these frameworks have come in and they're a lot more popular. And then we have things like Elm and Svelte. And I put both of these together because Elm and Svelte, remember, are actually just compilers. They just take your JavaScript code and convert it into regular JavaScript. And they're just different ways for us to write JavaScript code. And then finally, I also want to talk about Redwood JS. This is actually a fairly new library, but this is a high level library. What does that mean? Well, because apps are getting more and more complicated, React code, Angular code, Vue code is getting more and more complicated. Something like Redwood JS has come out that has a lot of tools built in, for example, routing, for example, cells and services. There's just easy ways for us to create forms to do things at a higher level. So again, you can think of it as how React is a super skill or a framework library that we can use with JavaScript. Redwood stays on top of that. So it uses React, but it has extra features already built in. Now, right now, the two that I would recommend if you really want to focus on job is probably React and Vue, maybe Angular as well, but my bet is on React still, even though it's a little harder to get started, it's still the number one way that you're probably going to find a job as a web developer. So definitely recommend React. As a matter of fact, I recommend React so much that Timmy is all about React. Remember Timmy, the friend of Jean-Claude, the octopus? Well, Timmy's an octopus too, and yes, doesn't have eight legs either, but let's not worry about that. Now, React 16 is actually the version of React. If you go to the React documentation, you can see the current version here. React version 16 introduced a lot of new things, a lot of updates. So as a modern React developer, you really need to know these newer features. For example, profiler for checking out your React performance, context API, react.memo for memoization and performance, portal for building modals and pop-ups, React Lazy again for performance, suspense, fragments, the async act for testing, something called hooks, which is really, really popular right now for us to build components in a newer way and also manage something called state. And the new concurrent mode, which essentially just allows our React apps to be faster. All of these are fairly new features that you should be aware of. Again, don't have to master them too much, but you should be aware of if you are a React developer. Now, we can't talk about these frameworks and libraries without talking about state management. 
What is that? Well, at the end of the day, what all these tools do is use JavaScript to display something on the page, right? They manipulate the DOM and display something on the page. But at the end of the day, what we display on the page is data, right? And state management is all about how do we manage this data? When I sign into a website, my name is going to appear as a logged in user. But then when I sign out, that state, that data changes. And as apps get bigger and bigger, you can't just manage your state just with these libraries. Sometimes you have to bring in specific libraries that help you with state management. For example, Vue has Vuex, Angular has NGRX, which uses something called observables. And then React has many, many things. You can get into huge debates with React state management. The most popular one is Redux. That's my favorite too. There's also Context API, which if you remember little Timmy, that's actually part of React for smaller scale state that you need to manage. Or you might have MobX, which again uses observable pattern or something more modern that has a lot of hype around it, which is using Apollo client, which has something called GraphQL, uses GraphQL, which we'll get into into the backend section. So all these options are there. Again, the ones that I recommend is really learning Redux because it does teach really solid computer science principles and also a little bit of Apollo and GraphQL just because it's very trendy right now, but don't dive too deep into it. Until you use it on a project, you don't really need to know every single detail. Then we have something called component libraries. The beauty is that with all these tools, there's component libraries that you can use. For example, React has a large community of developers that have already built components. You want a date picker, a color picker, maybe you want a search bar where somebody has already built it in React. And you can use different libraries, component libraries, to just download and use those components. Same with Angular, same with Vue. All of these things have component libraries. Hmm. What about this SSR thing? Well, SSR stands for server side rendering. Remember in the fundamentals part, how I talked about server side and client side rendering. Oh wait, I didn't really, did I? Well, that's because server side and client side rendering is all about where should we render or where should we calculate what the HTML page should display? You can do it on the server side or you can do it on the client side, which is on the user's phone or computer on their browser. Well, all of these libraries and frameworks out of the box do client side rendering. Hey, use the power of my cell phone to display the page. Hey, use the power of the user's computer to display the page. But you can also do something called server side rendering. If you control your servers or the computer that sends those HTML, JS and CSS file, you have the option to do that. Now we won't get into what the differences are. There are some implications like SEO when it comes to that. But the key thing is that you should know that they exist. For example, with React, you can use something like Next.js. With Angular, you can use Angular Universal. With Vue, Nox.js or even something like Sapper if you're using Svelte. Again, you don't need to focus too much on it, just to understand the difference between server-side rendering and client-side rendering. Personally, I would recommend Next.js if you really wanna get into it, but as you can see, no rocket ship there. Now, one note I wanna give because I guarantee you I'll get this question is, what about Svelte? It's the newest library that has come out it's gaining a lot of traction. Should I learn Svelte? And honestly, not really, because there just isn't that much job demand yet. It's still fairly new. I personally don't think it offers that big of a value compared to what's already out there, like React and Angular or Vue. But it is quite useful because it is performant that it might be good for low-powered embedded devices that need UI. So for example, both small devices that don't have a lot of power, that still have some sort of UI or user interface, well, maybe Svelte, you should consider it, but for getting a job, no, not yet. Holy moly, that's a lot, but I think we're getting there. So let's see. We talked about JavaScript fundamentals, frameworks, which was a big one. We have only a few more things. 
Let's talk about helpers. And helpers are, well, technically build tools as well. But these are ways for us to help write JavaScript as programmers. So we have things like Babel that allow us to write the newest features of JavaScript. We have things like ESLint, which is kind of like a spell checker for our JavaScript. If we ever make a mistake, well, ESLint is going to check our code and say, oh, you should fix that up. That's why it's a helper. We also have something like Prettier, and Prettier is almost like an auto formatter. It takes your code and makes sure that all your spaces look nice, all your indentation on your code looks nice. These three are very useful to use. And then we have build tools. And build tools are essentially things that allow us to do things to our projects and files that we might not want to do manually. For example, I have here a project that I created for Create React App. So Create React App is a CLI or a command line interface that allows me to build a React project without having to do things manually myself. So I just ran this command, and now if I open up my Sublime Text, I have all these files and this project already pre-built for React. So all this boilerplate code is done for me. And I have commands like npm start or npm build to run certain commands. For example, npm start, if I run it, is going to build the project and actually display it on a web page for me. Just like that. I could also run npm run build. And if I look over here, I now have a build folder magically just through that command that contains all my files. Remember our CSS, JavaScript, well, and some images? It's all there. I even have my HTML file. So that's what build tools do. And npm scripts, which I just used, is what you usually do when creating a project. Before, we also used to have something like Gulp. It still exists, less often used, but let's say if you want to do certain things, like you want to zip some files or compress some files, well, you can use Gulp to do that. We also have something called module bundlers, something like Webpack, Rollup, Parcel. Well, remember how JavaScript had modules, which are essentially different sort of JavaScript files? As we got more and more JavaScript files, we wanted to actually, at the end, combine it all into one single JavaScript file and send it to the user. This is what module bundling is. It bundles modules. If we go to the Webpack website, we see that it not only does JavaScript, but it does a whole lot of things and spits out our JavaScript, our CSS files. Now, the importance of Parcel, Webpack, and Rollup has diminished a little bit, mainly because a lot of these things are configurations that you don't really need to understand. Things like Create React App do it automatically for you. For example, they have already gzipped my files. They have created different chunks of JavaScript, of CSS, that is optimized for delivery. Because modern browsers now don't necessarily need one large giant JavaScript file. You might only want to send JavaScript that is needed or files that the user actually needs and only load up new files when a user visits a different page. So for now, I recommend just knowing about them, but Webpack, for example, is used underneath the hood for Create React App. Rollup is really, really good if you're a library creator and you want to create your own NPM modules. Or you can use Parcel, which allows you to do some module bundling without too much config that, well, with Webpack, it'll be a huge headache. All right, we're almost done, people. The last little part here is, well, all websites now, you pretty much have to create responsive mobile-first design. That is, if you're a front-end developer, you can't just assume that everybody will be using a computer. You now have to build with mobile in mind. That is, to make sure that all these views and web pages that you create also work on mobile. And we already talked about that with things like CSS Grid or CSS Flexbox. It's just a standard now. We then have something like Web Components. Now, Web Components is one of those things that has been around for a long time, especially something like Polymer. But there are tools like Lit Elements and Stencil. And what they are is an idea developed by Google that says, hey, it wouldn't it be nice if we had shareable components, little date pickers, little search boxes, little user 
cards that can be used all across the web, that can be used between Angular, between React, between Vue, that we can share these web components and plug and play web components to any website. It's an idea that is taking a bit of time to pick up. I wouldn't worry too much about it, just know that it exists. And then we talk about package management. This is the reason why JavaScript is so popular. The reason JavaScript is so popular is because of all the tools and libraries and code that people have built, that the community have built, that you can now use and share. You don't have to create things from scratch. There's a lot of tools, a lot of problems that have already been solved that you can now use. And that's where package management comes in. And with JavaScript, package management, it happens on the NPM registry. It's right here. And it was actually recently acquired by GitHub, which is owned by Microsoft, which also owns VS Code. They're everywhere. But NPM allows me to search any packages that I want. Let's say I wanted a date picker. Well, I can do a date picker search and somebody has already built that. Look, somebody built a React date picker. So I can now download this JavaScript file and use it in my project. So the NPM registry allows us to use code, use modules that we haven't written and build our project. Now, there's also something called an anti-NPM registry, which is just something I made up, but it goes against NPM. The problem with NPM is that, well, it's controlled by one central governing body, and Entropic tries to essentially have a more, less centralized NPM registry or a package registry. Still growing, but interesting looking at, especially now that NPM has been acquired by Microsoft. Now, you may have seen me run these commands in my terminal, that is npm to run certain commands like npm run build. Again, these are just commands or build tools that I can run and scripts that I can run using npm. npx is a way for us to install packages. For example, if I go to create React app, let's see where it is. There it is. You can see that I can run npx create React app to create a boilerplate code and NPX makes sure that we always use the latest version of Create React App. So again, because I recommend learning React, definitely know these two things. And Yarn is another option for you to use for installing packages and third-party libraries, but they've had a few issues now. It came out of Facebook, but they now have an issue where Yarn 2 just came out that is not compatible with or very different from the original Yarn, and I would personally just stick with NPM. Finally, there are some popular libraries that you should be aware of. D3.js, which is for charting. Axios, which is for fetch requests with extra tools. You have things like Moment and Date FNS, which are for dates, Ramda for functional programming, RxJS for something called observables, Immer for something called immutables, Lodash and Underscore, which are very popular utility libraries that are less often used now that JavaScript language has a lot more features. All right, that's a lot, and I promise I'm almost done. We just have this one last thing to talk about, and this is the Jamstack. This is actually something that I included very last minute on the video because it's growing at a really fast pace, and I think it's an interesting thing to keep an eye on. That's why I have a little rocket, but you don't necessarily have to dive too deep into this, but it is a movement in the web that's happening that you should definitely keep an eye on. And Jamstack is all about static sites. Remember when I showed you Redwood JS? Well, look at that. It's a bringing full stack to Jamstack tool. So what is this whole Jamstack? I personally don't like the name. Uh, it stands for JavaScript APIs and Markdown. It tries to bring the web to how it was before. I have a great image here to demonstrate exactly what is happening with Jamstack. The idea with Jamstack is, well, let's talk about the initial way. So initially, we, as developers or as programmers, we write a website's program, we send it to the server, and then the server produces the HTML on demand. And the user goes to google.com and the server sends the user or the client the HTML file. With Jamstack, it's a little bit different. We write our code, 
and our JavaScript. And then we build these files and deliver them to something like a CDN. And the CDN, which is just a fancy way of saying a server that is closer to the user, the server just has pre-built files. Now, Jamstack is a topic that I'll get into in a separate video because it is a lot. The key thing to remember is that they're trying to simplify the web because what happened with React and Angular and Vue is that all these JavaScript files started getting more and more bloated, bigger and bigger and bigger. So that when you load an app on your screen, it runs a lot of JavaScript. Instead, Jamstack says, hey, especially for websites like blogs, some static sites, sites that just display things already, let's just pre-build this. Something like Gatsby is actually a static site generator. What that means is you write your code and then you click run and Gatsby takes all that code that you wrote and puts it into a neat HTML, CSS and JavaScript file. And those files are the files that you upload to the server. This way, a lot of the content, such as a blog post, can be displayed right away to a user instead of having to run all this JavaScript. And anything that needs to get updated, such as a user logs in and we now have to display a username, we can just use APIs and do that afterwards. So for example, we can use something like Hugo to build static sites. We can use something like Gritsum, which is for Vue.js, Gatsby, which is for React. We even have Scully, which is for building Angular apps. We have Jekyll, which is a very popular one with Ruby. And this actually relates to something called a content management system, something really popularized with WordPress. WordPress back in the day was really, really popular. It still is because it allowed people that don't really need to learn how to code to build beautiful websites and beautiful blogs using themes and just using an interface like this, a dashboard like this to write up blog posts. Well, now there's a movement towards these static sites. Let's say you wanted to build a blog post, but you don't really need to go into all this trouble. You can use something like a headless CMS. So unlike WordPress that already had pre-built themes and ways that the website can look, you can use something like Contentful, for example, and have your own content management system, a place for you to write blog posts. And it's headless because it doesn't have any client-side code. That is, it doesn't necessarily tell you how you should build your front end. As a matter of fact, this website, my Zero to Mastery website, is doing exactly that. It's using Contentful to write blog posts but how the blog looks, it's completely up to me. This is written from scratch. But quick note, if you were paying attention, you might be wondering to yourself, what exactly is the difference here between static sites versus that thing you were talking about called SSR or server-side rendering? Isn't that the same thing? Well, let's talk about the two of the most popular ones. For Server-side rendering, we have Next.js. And for Jamstack or static site generation, we have Gatsby.js. They both use React underneath the hood. They are both server-side. So what's the difference? Well, Gatsby is before the server. So think of it this way. Before I even upload my files to a server, I use Gatsby.js to take all my code and spit out static files. That is JavaScript, CSS, and HTML. That's what Gatsby does. You use it before you even deploy your code to production or to the server. On the other hand, server-side rendering with Next.js is we upload all the code. We don't generate any new code. We upload it all to the server. So the server is now listening to the client. And as the client makes requests, Next.js is going to work and display different things. So Next.js is what we use on our server, the code on the server, versus with Gatsby, we use it even before we put the code on the server. And instead, the server simply sends those files. And on the client side, we use something called APIs to 
do interactive things like display user information. So that's the difference there. Gatsby is pre-server. Next.js is on the server. So keep an eye on the Jamstack. Jamstack is going to be quite big over the next couple of years. All right, that's it. Front end seems pretty overwhelming, doesn't it? But as you can see, there's only a few things that you need to focus on, little rockets here. The rest are just important for you to understand and know that they exist and how they relate to one another. But you can spend your whole career in the front end. Like I said, it's a good idea to start here, get a job right away, and then dive deeper into the other topics. Up until now, we've been talking about the front end, which is what does the user see? But we haven't really talked about the server. Servers were just something that somebody else owned. But as a backend developer, we can have control as to what the server does. Instead of just what do we display to the user, we can now say, hey, what data do we send to the client? What data do we receive from the client? So let's get into that.